Welcome to our Zoom Ecumenical Good Friday meditation and panel discussion, April 2nd, 2021. I'm Reverend Mary Lynn White, Pastoral Care Minister for Woodlawn United Church. Once each person on our panel has introduced themselves and lit a candle, we will begin with a scripture reading, which will be the Good Friday story from the Gospel of Mark, read by Reverend Dr. Darlene Brewer. This will be followed by an opening prayer. Then I'll ask each of our panel some questions connected to Good Friday, and they will give a one or two minute answer, depending on the question. After that, we will have some time to reflect while we listen to some gentle harp music. Our time together will be over once each of our candles is extinguished, a symbol of the darkness that covered the earth when Christ was crucified. Will the panel now introduce themselves and light your candle after your, your introduction, please? We'll begin with Christopher. My name is uh, Pastor Christopher Drew, and I am the, uh, the lead minister at Stevens Road United Baptist Church. Arlene. I'm Reverend Dr. Darlene Brewer, and I am pastor at Windhome Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Ivan. I'm the Reverend Ivan Gregan, and I'm the minister at Port Wallace United Church. Matthew. I'm the Reverend Matthew Sponigal, and I'm rector at St. Luke's Anglican Church. And Shirley. I'm Reverend Shirley Karras, and I'm the priest in charge at the Church of the Holy Spirit. And thank you for being here. And now we will have our scripture reading. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests had a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, you say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? for he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. 
and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes were also mocking him among themselves and saying he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatini, which means, O oh God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body had been laid. Let us pray. Let us pray. Good Friday, God. Look upon us graciously, we pray. For we are your people for whom your beloved Jesus was willing to be betrayed to be laid open to the powers of this world and to suffer death on a cross. Grant us, O oh God, your comforting presence as we recall the events surrounding his death and grant that we might be with him through death to resurrection. We open our hearts to your loving Holy Spirit as we pray in the name of our crucified Savior. Amen. Amen. And now for our questions. Number one, why did Jesus die? I'm looking for a one minute answer, please. Beginning with Christopher. Thanks. Um... I would answer this one differently at, at different times, but the one that came to mind right now is um, as Jesus died because a coalition of 
uh, powerful political leaders and religious leaders uh, wished it so. Um, and he died uh, because he, he wanted to demonstrate uh, something of, of God's love to the people around him. Darlene. I think Jesus died as he did because he lived as he did. He gave in his life a commitment to everyone around him to embrace justice and love and mercy. And the powers that be had no time for his words of mercy and justice. And so Jesus died as he did because he committed to love. And that is the call for all of us. Ivan. I believe that Jesus is the light sent from God into our midst to guide us home to God. And I believe that Jesus died because evil, the forces that attempt to separate us from God, could see that Christ was leading people back to a healthy and holy relationship with God and liberating people from fear, servitude, and exile. Therefore, evil was losing his power. And anytime we challenge power or evil is challenged in the form of power, Jesus then was murdered by that evil in an attempt to destroy God's plan of calling all of God's children back home. Matthew. Uh, I think Jesus died because it's what civilization does. Um, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And the message that Jesus brought, the life that Jesus brought, was, was subverting the power and authority and privilege of an elite group. And they did what they had to do, they thought, to protect what they had enjoyed. And um, we see it all through history. The, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And surely. Well, I think from a, a very practical perspective, Jesus' death was all about the Romans exercising their imperial power over the people of Jerusalem. Um, two kingdoms, the kingdom of God clashing with the imperial kingdom. It was a mob mentality. It was kind of inevitable. But I guess for me, especially if I don't rush ahead to Easter morning, I think Jesus' death was all about standing up for the kingdom of God, standing up for the values that are inherent in the kingdom of God that Jesus taught, that he exemplified in his life, and that he did in his death. Love, compassion, humility, and mercy. Okay, thank you. Question number two. What does take up your cross mean to you? I'm looking for a two minute answer, please. Beginning with Ivan. Take up your cross for me is a call from Jesus to look at my own life and specifically look at those things about my life or in my life that I might consider to be a burden or to be shameful or be to, to be commendable, condemnable. Something that others might point out as to be a point of ridicule or secret that uh, should be my shame in the eyes of the world, or a fact about my life that would make me less than desirable according to the judgment of this world. This is what I believe my cross is. These things for me are my own private crosses that I might have been taught by the world to be considered shameful or sinful or staining, and which have been in times past to me humiliating, hurtful, or haunting. I believe that evil does everything possible to separate us from God and does this essentially by saying, you are unlovable, you are unacceptable, you are unable to be loved by God. You must be what you are not before God can love you. Yet God says to me, pick up your cross, Ivan. Take that by which you are condemned and by which others are condemning you and own it. Make it your own, pick it up, say, this is me. And by doing that, you bear not only your own cross, but you may also help another bear his or hers. I believe that the cross of Jesus symbolizes all our crosses. He was assured enough of God's love and acceptance to pick up his cross and walk through the humiliation of the world's condemnation toward death, to give us the courage to follow in his footsteps. So for me, I pick up my cross, knowing who I am and what I am. And Christ gives me the courage to bear my cross. And by bearing my cross, 
I can set others at liberty and show others that, yes, we can be Christian and that God loves us. So I believe very strongly I must pick up my cross and follow Christ. Darlene. Thanks, Mary Lynn. I, I think we have to be careful about this one. I've heard some bad pastoral advice through the years, and I remember back to my childhood when my mother heard bas bad pastoral advice about taking up her cross um, and living in an abusive situation and to be told to stay in it because uh, she was to endure her suffering. Mm. That is a very painful reality for a lot of people. And unfortunately, people still are encouraged to take up suffering as if that is the point. Mm -hmm. And Jesus invites us, I think, to think about suffering, how we can diminish suffering, hopefully how we can rid suffering, rid our world of suffering. And think about how crosses exist on a societal level. What is the cross that different groups in our society are having to bear? And how can we start to identify those crosses and those pains and those roads of suffering in our society? And how can we in the church be allies and supporters and people in solidarity um, and say, how can we help you take up your cross? And hopefully to come to an end of suffering, not to create more suffering or to encourage people to suffer, but to see an end to suffering for all those who do suffer, especially at the hands of something that is something we can change in society. If we have the potential and the power to change something in the name of Jesus Christ, then we are called to do so. Christopher. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Darlene, I really appreciated that note, thanks. Um, because I've I've heard similar things to that too, or or especially when yeah I guess this is just my cross to bear, um, used in actually a, a pretty flippant way in a uh, I couldn't find a parking spot I guess that's just my part past cross to bear today. Um, what when I guess when I hear that phrase I think of um, I guess what we what we would have acknowledged yesterday in Monday Thursday when Jesus introduced the command to love people as as he loved people. Uh, so when I think of picking up the cross, I, I think of that, that, that death to self, or, or I guess that death to self impulse that, that whatever it is within me that, that wants to place myself ahead of, ahead of you, or wants to use you in some way for, for my means. Um, and that, that kind of behavior and impulse in, in some sense of the word can be celebrated in, in, in our culture and cultures throughout time and, and place. Um, and I think Jesus uh, told us that that's, that's the part of us that needs to, needs to die. Um, that if we want to emulate uh, Christ's, Christ's teaching uh, and behavior, that it's, that it's, it's, it's that um, it's, it's that reminder of, of me. Yeah. Of me releasing uh, me, uh, to, to God, to, uh, to, to find something better. And Shirley. I, th this question's a hard one for me and mm -hmm. sort of like, um, Darlene and Christopher were saying, there've been times when I've understood that that phrase to be a more and you have to excuse my expression here but um you know come on suck it up kind of thing mm -hmm. um especially when I think of the phrase uh that appears in the synoptic gospel sort of to deny yourself to leave your family to leave your friends all the things that meant something to you all the people that you loved and come along and um follow Christ that sort of thing but that seems so very inconsistent with my um, my view that God is love, yeah. right? And so I've been <clears throat> reflecting on Jesus's walk uh, to Golgotha and him carrying his cross until he can no longer carry it himself. Yeah. And I came to the conclusion that, you know, it would be very different for me 
if the cross hadn't been carried, if the cross had been just laying on the ground where mm -hmm. Jesus was to be crucified, but he carried it with assistance from Simon Serene. And, and carrying that cross, I found to be really symbolic and not just of the crucifixion that was going to take place. For me, it was Jesus was carrying along and I'm called to carry along all the inequities, the injustices of this secularized world, the marginalized, those persons and situations that Jesus was concerned about. Then I'm called to carry my cross to keep those situations and people in my heart as part of my daily life, not forgetting them, not leaving them behind, taking them with me, embracing that God wants me to love those persons, uh, to do something to, with those situations, making it known to them that they're part of God's kingdom, just as we are. And so um, I, th I think it's a heavy cross. I think it's a heavy burden to carry. But I think we're called to carry it. And with God's help, hopefully we can. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughtful answers, everyone. The next question. How do you relate to the Good Friday story? A two-minute answer, please beginning with Shirley again. Well, <clears throat> let's just say, first of all, that I don't want to relate to the Good St Friday story at all, but I know that, <laughs> that I can't skip over it. But it's tempting at times because the extreme emotions that it evokes, it's hard, it's really hard. But if I'm truthful, I do relate to it in several ways, but I'll, I'll speak to two. I relate to to Peter. I relate to his humanity. When the gospel authors write Peter's responses at various and sort of times, they're sort of like the ones like, Jesus, you know, like, I don't get it. How can this be? And not in those exact words, of course, but along those lines. And, and I get that. I get Peter. I would have been pretty confused too. And in the Good Friday story, I think of Peter denying Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And it was another facet, I believe, of his humanity. And unfortunately, another facet I can relate to. It can be pretty terrifying and scary to think that you may have to admit something that you know is right, um, but that is going to bring about some personal disfavor or some grief or some fright or whatever. I can still visualize in my mind when I was in grade three and some of my little classmates and I, we did something that we weren't supposed to do. It wasn't anything too bad, but we weren't supposed to do it. And when our teacher asked us to, you know, raise our hands, the whodunit question, I wouldn't put up my hand and admit it. I really, really loved my teacher and I was so scared that she would think less of me. I was also a little scared I'd get in trouble with my parents, but I was maybe only around eight years old. But you know, it bothers me to this day that I didn't tell the truth. <laughs> like Peter, I was human and I was afraid. And you know, that, that catches me from, from time to time. Backing off and telling a non-truth, a little white lie can be much easier and safer. If only we didn't have to live with our consciences. And I wonder what Peter's conscience was like that day. And the second relatable bit, I, I guess, is when I think of the women gathered at the cross um, who um, were like mothers in many respects to Jesus. I think of what it would be like as a mother to have to watch something like that. I have a son who has very deep convictions and, you know, to have to watch him carry those around and, you know, get criticized for them and all that kind of stuff. It, it's tough. So anyway, thanks. Matthew. 
the part I connect with most in the Good Friday story is a little odd, I guess, because it's from Luke's Gospel and only found in Luke's Gospel. And it's when Jesus is on the cross and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I, and I find it just touches me right to the heart of, of the gospel message that here are these opponents who represent a lot of evil in the world, uh, who do to this man who spoke love and forgiveness and mercy, spoke to him about evil and visited on him such violence and brutality and what love to be able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I carry that because I know how I feel inside sometimes when I see, well, actually, sometimes when people steal a car parking space from me, I can curse under my breath and, and <laughs> condemn them kind of thing. Um, some of the uncharitable thoughts when I'm reading the comments of the Facebook posts, you know, like never read the comments, but I, I can feel within me this sort of spurning, this, this, this wanting to, to condemn and, and to hear instead words of forgiveness is, is God's word embodied among us. It is God's, God's love present in our world. It's a, it's a love that I can understand in terms of being a father with my children, that I don't want them to perform. They don't have to do the right things and not make mistakes in order for me to love them. I love them in essence for who they are, regardless of whether or not they misbehave or they make errors, right? And I see on that cross uh, the most dramatic, most poignant um, display of love that I think a human being could ever have uh, in the face of such violence and in, in evil. And uh, I, I uphold that as that love that God has for us. And it's a love that I want to better reflect in our world. Um, and, and that probably leads into the next question. So I'm not going to say any more about that. <laughs> Darlene. I'm really moved by the passion story each year as probably all of us are and different people speak to me uh, from the story each year. And this year, uh, there are two. So Pilate, you know, and kind of trying to wash his hands of it, but the, at the same time saying, why am I washing my hands of this? What has this man done? And I think about in our society, how many people are convicted uh, of things that they have not done and how Jesus was was crucified, which was such a common thing. And the pain that must have been endured by those people who allowed it to happen. And so I think about Pilate and I think about those in places of power in our society and how easy it is to allow things to go on, even with our own conflicts and our own um, stories of torment in our own places that aren't healed to allow them to just fester and be rather than doing something to change things. Uh, it's very hard to stand up to our own places of pain. It's very hard in society to stand up to those places that do not want to be moved or changed. And so I have some sympathy for Pilate in the story. And I think too of those women, and I think of how they're mourning and how in a way they're kind of just, just kind of classified as, as their own group. And, and we know, of course, if we skip ahead to the resurrection that they're not believed, right? And so I think about all those who mourn and all those who need comfort in our society. And in some ways people who mourn, but don't get to mourn publicly because of social convention or because of judgments or because of the ways in which our society and even our churches are arranged and the laws that we have. And so I remember them when I remember Jesus. 
and the pain that still goes on in the world when people cannot mourn. We think about COVID and all the people who have lost loved ones and even the loss of our own ways of being in the world and the pain that that causes. And I think about all that and remember those women especially and, and those who cannot mourn in the ways that they need to. Thank you everyone for your thoughtful answers. Question number four, do we need to observe Good Friday? Again, a two minute answer, please, beginning with Christopher. Uh, absolutely. Um, yes, uh, there is this, there is this in, intense desire, I think, to skip from celebration to celebration, from, from feast to feast, from joy to joy. Uh, and, and I think we all need to acknowledge what a, a unique point of privilege that mentality is, um, that I can somehow jump from, say, the Palm Sunday parade all the way to Easter Sunday, and that I don't have to trudge through uh, Good Friday and, and Holy Saturday uh, when, or in the fullness of time uh, and, and culture, people did not get to do that, that they, they had to endure suffering. One of, the, one of the biggest problems that so many people have with their faith is they don't understand how to relate to God when something goes wrong, because there's a sense of, well, if I, if I do what I'm supposed to do, God will do what he's supposed to do, and my life should be fine. And, and again, I, I take Darlene's point really well, that there, there is some suffering that comes into your life that is, that is not, not sanctified and is not there to teach you anything. It's because somebody else or, or something else is doing something uh, evil, uh, and, and that, that should be removed. Um, but, but there is suffering that you are not going to avoid, that, that nobody Nobody did anything wrong. Uh, nobody, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just, it just is what ended up coming into your life. And, and we need to, we need to know that uh, Jesus in, in all his earthly perfection could not avoid suffering. Um, and, and we are not going to either. And, and I think we need to have those honest moments when we cry out, you know, my God, my God, did you abandon me? Because hopefully, uh, in, and again, in due course, in a time of healing, we, we do eventually get to the answer of, no, I was not abandoned in that moment. But if we, don't, if we don't suffer the small things, when the big things come to us, we, we, just, we won't have the tools in our toolbox. So no, absolutely. Good Friday is, is so critically important. Matthew. Yeah, for me, it's, it's critically important too. Um, from my perspective, I think I look at Good Friday as uh, a time for introspection, reflection, and growth. I look at it more from my own, my own place as a Christian rather than as a community leader. And I think Hopefully as a community, we're also doing this as a faith community in a church or a, in a wider community amongst um, the ecumenical circles. But um, for me, it holds up a mirror. And it's, it's a difficult thing to look in that mirror on Good Friday. I see the world um, being in that dark place, seeing those people who were so hellbound on protecting their privilege and their authority and their influence um, they wanted to protect the status quo. And this person who came along, who represented God, who was the word, God's word, lived among us and started welcoming in the outcasts, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Gentiles, the, you know, the list goes on. And it was such a radical type of love and inclusion. And it so contradicted the status quo that the extent that those powerful privileged people went to protect that is just truly, truly disturbing. And, it, and as I said before, it, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped and it continues. We've seen it in our own communities. 
And just during this COVID pandemic, I mean, we've heard it over and over again. When we had that mass shooting in Nova Scotia, the voice of feminists cried out and said, this is not surprising. Mm. This is what happens. This is what happens with toxic masculinity. When, when we had Mr. Floyd beaten by police and people were shocked and suddenly their eyes were open to, to what the reality of, of the black community is, and it's, we hear the voices saying, this is our everyday life and we've been telling you for years and you're not listening. Um, this is the Matthew Shepard story for the gay community. This, this happens over and over again. Um, our Muslim brothers and sisters after the 9-11 thing, like just recently, the violence against the Asian community yeah. in the United States. It might not be as brutal as what they put Jesus through in terms of whipping, but it is in another sense. Sometimes it's a death by a thousand different cuts. And, and almost that makes it work because it makes it so normal that we don't even see it anymore. We're blinded to it. And so Good Friday is that opportunity for me to look into my life and, 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 and really take a critical look, a look in the mirror and say, where am I enjoying this privilege? Where am I being uncharitable towards others? Where am I not speaking out where I can, um, standing up where I can? Where am I not loving as Christ loved? And it's a dark place to be. And that is that difference from going from the glory of the palms to the glory of the resurrection. It is a dark road of the cross, but that's for me where I believe my growth happens every year I, I feel like I'm slowly being made holier. I'm slowly getting the message. And I would hope, you know, in a fantasy kind of world, like, you know, well, once you're ordained, you've kind of got it and you got it under control. I'm not, I'm still a work in progress. And I, I, I sometimes look back and wonder, you know, what kind of church leader was I, what, what was I, 17 years ago when I started, because I didn't connect to any of this. Mm. And then I wonder, where am I going to be in 17 years? Mm. And I hope that's the whole idea of sanctification, that we're all in this process of being changed by God's love, by the work of the Holy Spirit, by Christ's guidance in the scriptures, being molded into what God wants us to be. And it's only by breaking away from all the joy. And there is so much joy. Don't get me wrong. There's so much joy in the gospel story. But sometimes I feel like I have to step away from that in order to really enter more fully into that joy. And to Ivan. For me, I look at the commandments of the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, depending on which place you're looking. And the Jews always say, remember and observe. And for me, Good Friday is both a remembrance and an observance. I observe, it's a time to go away from the world, to think of the world, to look at the world critically, to see where the world is suffering, to see where people are hurt in the world, to see where my brothers and sisters are being persecuted, to see where people are being humiliated and crushed down, to see where they're being whipped by the powers that be in the world. It's a time to move away from all the busyness and just to observe and say, let me see with your eyes, O oh Christ, the world as you see it. Good Friday is also for me a time to remember. My grandmother died on Good Friday. We buried her on Easter Monday. So every time I go to Good Friday, I go with that sense of loss, of losing someone you love. And I think of Mary and Joseph losing their child, losing everything they had dreamed, losing all the hope. And for those who have lost a child, that wells up within me on Good Friday. And yes, I crawl into the church, get away from the world, and just have a good cry at the own, my own losses in life. But then I cry not only for myself, I cry for all the people who have not had the ability to cry, who have been told, keep a step off her lip. Oh, come on, you'll get through this. So it's a sense of really going deep into myself and enter into anguish and almost at times a physical anguish. So I think, yes, I have to observe Good Friday. And I think observing Good Friday is essential to my Christian pilgrimage because it joins me with the suffering of my brothers and sisters around me. It joins me in my mind to the suffering of Christ. But more than that, it joins me to all the suffering in this world and say, it is not, not 
lost. You didn't just go through it and get over it. Mm. I believe that the light of God is constantly being snuffed out in the world around me. And it is constantly being snuffed out in my personal journey. And Good Friday draws attention to that. Yes, the light is being snuffed out. But in Good Friday, I know that Christ is there with me in my darkness. I know that God is willing to enter into my darkness. I know that God is willing to enter into my pain. God is willing to enter into my struggles, personal struggles, church struggles, life struggles. And I know that God knows that what is killing me is something that God validates. That God does not turn it back and say, oh, get over it. Mm. To know that God is willing to be with me is of utmost importance. And that's what is for me Good Friday, to know that God is with me. God is not off in some ethereal paradise where everything is well above and beyond us and not concerned with the world. Good Friday tells me to know God is in the world. And in every suffering person, I see God. And God enters into all suffering with that person that is suffering. For me, the purpose of Good Friday is that God offers me the assurance that in my life and even in death, God will not abandon me and that God will be with me. So therefore, to observe Good Friday to me is to remember all the things that have happened in Good Friday, but to observe all the world is that is happening and to know that God is in that. And Good Friday is for me that assurance God is with us in all this world. Thank you, everyone, for your very thoughtful uh, answers. Before we get to our fifth and final question, I just want to say right after everyone is finished answering, there will be silence, a silent uh, reflection time. And then after that, uh, we will put out our candles. Okay, so number five. What have you been grieving this year? We are back to a one minute answer, please. Beginning with Christopher. Yeah. Um, loss of, of community, I guess. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of, of, of people um, and gatherings that have gone unseen and un, ungathered. Uh, uh, and 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 a, and a loss of time. Well, there are lots of things that I'll I'll, I'll just kind of kick down the line, and, and hopefully we'll do it next year or next year or next year. But there are there were some kind of once you know once in an opportunity moments that came and went, and uh, that's 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 been grieving me. I mourn the loss of my aunt who died in Newfoundland and whose funeral I could not attend. That was a very painful moment for me. And I hold up with that loss, all the losses of those who have lost loved ones this year, those who have died, those who have been ill. I mourn the loss also of the young Indigenous woman who died in the Quebec hospital because her cries were ignored. Mm -hmm. And I think about the ways in which she was mocked and ignored and uh, made to feel less than. And that ties with the story of Good Friday and how Jesus was mocked and scorned. And I, I grieve the loss of justice uh, when things like this happen and we don't find our way through them. We don't see how we keep hearing these stories and we don't find a way to make it better. Ivan. I think I grieve the separation from my people more than anything else. These people give me life, they give me happiness, they give me a reason to live and to be separated from them is absolute torture and it's deadening. There's a portion of me that's dying because I'm missing them so much. I miss the hugs after worship. I miss, miss catching up on the news. I miss seeing the little babies that are being born. I miss com confirming people into the body of Christ. I miss going to people who are mourning and celebrating this death, this life that was ours. I miss catching up on the stories and all that's happening in this world. In some ways, I feel like my people are becoming strangers to me. I miss children. I miss their insights, their comedy, the way they look at me and talk to me. I miss the power of congregational singing and that wonderful praise that was offered up to God. 
In many ways, I feel like I'm out in exile. I miss home. Matthew. I thought a lot about this. There's so many things, but if I'm going to sum it up in one thing, I grieve the sense of balance in my life. Um, finding space for me, just feeling like there's so many more demands on me than there ever were from having, you know, kids at home because they couldn't be in school and you know, they're young, they need constant attention for that, that period. Uh, church, um, just so many new things that I had to learn so quickly, things that were normally just second, you know, we wouldn't have to give a second thought to. They were just natural. It wouldn't take me any time at all to complete something. All of a sudden, it became a humongous task. And that eats away at the time that I have for exercise or leisure reading or umpteen other things. Like my entire sense of balance has been completely toppled. And I'm, and I'm longing for, for a time when this can return where, where something does start to feel normal again. And Shirley. Well, <clears throat> I think personally, <coughs> excuse me, I've certainly been grieving uh, family time and friend time and phone calls and Zoom calls are great, but I really, really miss the personal contact. There's never been a time before where I haven't seen my brother for a year. Mm. You know, I have a little granddaughter who's not quite three and I can't spend time with her. And, you know, the grieving also breeds worrying too. I, wor I worry about my, my friends and my family when I can't be with them. I grieve for the many communities in our province who have experienced such horrific losses this year. Um, it, I, I just felt that part of my heart was missing. I mean, and they just kept coming and coming and I felt so, so helpless other than offering prayers. It was, there was nothing I could do. But I think one of the things I, I grieve a lot is that I feel that I personally cannot um, carry or share Christ's love and compassion to uh, to people in the way that I would like to. And, and that sounds a lot about me. And I, and I, I don't mean to make it about me because it isn't about me, but my heart really aches and it really grieves for that, that I can't sort of go about and do things the way I was used to doing them. Um, the way that gave me that contact. And like I have said, it, 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 it nourishes it, it. It gives us life as well. Um, I am embrace the new ways of doing church, the Zoom call, for example, despite, you know, a few hiccups here and there. Uh, I, I embrace that, but yet I, I miss being able to worship the way we worshiped before, you know, and looking at what line I'm on and if I'm going in the right direction and, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's been a tough year. Days go into days, weeks go into weeks, months go into months. And I think, how did I get here? Um, but the, the th thankfully, uh, I'm not on this journey alone. Um, anyway, thank you.